other people. Tonight, we're going to continue on in our uh, Staying on Guard series. Last week, we talked about um, guarding your words. We talked about uh, wear your mouth guard out in Ephesians 4.29, uh, which you heard in that skit about not letting any, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is useful to building people up, that which is useful to edifying people. And so um, if you missed last week's message, you can always go online, check us out, um, and you can find that message. Tonight, we're going to uh, we're gonna kind of get a little bit more specific. I kind of talked a little bit about it last week, in last week's message, but tonight we're really going to kind of um, hit on this some more about uh, guarding your body, um, being intentional about guarding your body. So uh, one scripture, one verse is all we're going to kind of read, uh, Romans 12 and 1. Which I guess now is like two weeks ago. Let me just read one verse. Um, but it's cool because it's filled with so much. Um, Romans 2 and 1. And it may be a, a passage that a lot of us, uh, some of us rather are familiar with, some of us may not be familiar with. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I believe that after tonight's night, we'll all be on one accord as it relates to um, what God is saying in the scripture. Romans 12, verse 1. And this is what it says. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies. Everybody say bodies. bodies. To offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Tell the person beside you, whatever you do, whatever you make, do. Sure make sure you sure. guard your body. your body. You gotta say it like with some attitude. Your body. Your body. Your body. Your body. Your body. Word. Uh, let's pray. Father in Jesus' name, we just thank you, Lord, for um, everything that we have heard and seen thus far, Lord, for the worship that's gone forth, uh, for the skit and ministry that we've seen, Lord God. And we pray um, that your word, uh, God, would also resonate in our hearts, Lord, so much to the point where we're not just hearers of your word, but we're also doers of your word. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Romans 12 and 1. Uh, I love this scripture because it, it really is one of the most important scriptures in all of the Bible because of what it really, uh, really communicates. It communicates the whole essence of uh, who you and I are, have been created by God to be, which is simply to be people or instruments of worship. Uh, typically, when you get when we think of like instruments, we may think of piano, we may think of drums, we may think of violin, we may think of baritone, we may think of tuba, clarinet, whatever you play. You may be thinking of all of those different things, but all of those different things have a certain purpose, right? They have a certain purpose, and they are used in a certain way to produce a certain sound. And if those things happen to have some type of a um, a some type of uh, of thing that happens to it per se that now kind of affects it from being able to operate properly, then now it is not able to do exactly what it was made and formed to do. Right? For instance, uh, how many of you guys have ever played violin, viola, cello? I mean, don't be ashamed. I played it. It's not wrong. Cool. Awesome. Right. For those of you guys who play the string instrument, you know that the minute you pluck the strings off of the instrument, it is no longer useful. It can't produce a sound. Right? Uh, the keys. You're playing the keyboard. If you take these keys off this keyboard, you cannot play the keyboard no more. It is no longer effective. It is no longer used or no longer able to produce what, in fact, it was designed by the originator to produce, which is a quality sound. Such is the same now with your body and my body. How many of you guys have seen The Bodyguard or Whitney Houston before? Y'all seen that movie? Don't, don't be ashamed. Like, you see, fellas, some of y'all have seen it. Y'all ain't gonna tell nobody, but you've seen it. You know? Right? Right? Uh, so, y'all seen The Bodyguard, man. Uh, that movie came out like in like early 90s. It had Whitney Houston, uh, who, had, who was passed on, passed on a few years ago. And then you have Kevin Costner, who was like an Academy Award winning actor. And the whole premise of the movie is Kevin Costner, he plays like this secret agent guy, the CIA, CIA type agent, where now he is in charge of being a bodyguard for Whitney Houston's character. And Whitney Houston, she portrays this very well-known singer, this very popular singer, uh, who just absolutely has people and fans just flocking to her from this direction and the next. His role is to pretty much guard her body. Hence the reason, bodyguard. <laughs> Like, his role is to make sure that she is where she's supposed to be, that she's protected, that she's preserved. Like, that is his job. You see this also when it comes to, like, the President of the United States, Barack Obama. He has a just a fleet of people who surround him because they understand 
government, even though the government just had this little shutdown yesterday, but we're going to pray for the government that they would get their stuff together so that way some of you guys who have parents in the military aren't affected any longer. But that's a whole other message. Right? So pray, tell the person beside you, pray for the government. Just pray. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the president, he has all of these different types of people around him because their main responsibility is to preserve him. Because as they preserve him, they preserve the presidency. And if anything were to happen to him, it would now essentially throw off the order and the system in which things essentially flow. Yes, there may be a chain of command. Yes, there may be another person who's trying to take his, his spot in the event that something happens to him. But nonetheless, he is so important that he has people around him everywhere he goes. Like, he goes to the bathroom, they're standing outside. He goes to five guys, they're standing right inside. Right? He goes to play basketball, they're outside. Because it is very serious that we guard the President of the United States because he is that important. Now, when you begin to think about that, when you begin to think about that principle, think about it as well in relationship to who you are, like your body, and who God has created you to be. You were created for a certain purpose. That certain purpose is to glorify God. That certain purpose is to worship God. That certain purpose is to live for God, is to work for God, to serve God. The list goes on. But all in all, you were created for God. Tell the person beside you, you are for him, not for yourself. That is what you and I are created for. When, he, when the Bible says in Genesis that he created man in his likeness and in his image, he created us so that way we would be a reflection of him. And so if we are to be a reflection of him, and ultimately our bodies, our minds, everything that we've been talking about all these past few weeks should model who he is. That's what Paul says, Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be you that's also in Christ Jesus. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Because if we have been created in the image of Christ Jesus, then now we should exemplify the image of Christ Jesus. That's why the Bible says that we are the image bearers of God. Does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe so. That makes sense? Hopefully it does. Right. So now when we get all that understood and when we have that fundamental understanding of that, let's contrast that now with today's culture. Because in today's culture, today's culture is all about flaunting your body, right? Uh, you heard in the skit, they were gossiping about the young lady who had a little mini skirt or whatever type may be. The skirt came right, right here. <laughs> That's not a skirt. I don't know what that is. Don't tell me. I don't want to know. Um, but, but, right, you heard that. She had a little plunging neckline, as my mom would call it, where you can see just like everything, right? Showing everything but the Lord, right? And so, like, like now in our society, it's all about flaunting, right? Girls, I'm not just focusing on you because guys, it's the same thing, right? So you're swole, you're looking good, you've been in the gym, and you want to show that jank off, right? Like you want to go to the beach and you just want to walk around. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like you ain't never wanted to walk around with your t-shirt off in your life, but now all of a sudden, because you mentioned 152 pounds compared to 150 pounds, now all of a sudden you feel swole, right? <laughs> It's no different, right? You see, guys, now, now, it's, it's really bad because, like, it just happens just in normal day-to-day -day things. I was on my way uh, here earlier, and I happened to see a guy just running up and down the street, running down the street. All he had was, like, some little, little, some mini little shorts on with no shirts and some Nike Freeze on, right? Now, automatically, somebody would have fell in the lust by looking at him. Don't act like that's not true. Somebody with a fellow lust at the scene of dude who's all glistened up, all sweaty, with a six pack, right? Like breathing all heavy. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like doing all this crazy stuff. Like, like you, you can be like super duper saved and spiritual all you want to and act like, like you're just oblivious to everything that's around you that you have your eyes so focused on the cross where you just got tunnel vision and you don't even have a clue what's going on around you. The devil is a liar. Right, your flesh, though you have died to it, that jank is still alive. And if you and I are not careful, whether you are not engaged in seeing people who flaunt their body, or you and I are the ones who flaunt our body, it can lead to some serious and disastrous effects. Our culture is obsessed with the flaunting body. Our culture is obsessed with the body. So this is why people will get all these different types of implants. This is why people will get cheek implants and, 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 and nose changes and, and, and change the color of their eyes and, you know what I'm saying, like put some fake eyes in or something crazy like that. Like, like, like our culture is just really obsessed with, with, with the body, right? Like, like there's nothing wrong with studying the body. That's called anatomy. Oh my gosh, what in the world? This person might say biology. I'm not going to say who that was. Uh, <laughs> the 
There's nothing wrong with studying the body for beneficial purposes. There's a difference between studying and examining the body and actually being fixated on the body and obsessed with the body. Now this is when it turns from something that is beneficial to something that is harmful. Our culture is all about that. Flaunt what you got. Different strokes for different folks, right? Right? So what's tight to you may not be tight to me. Some of y'all haven't heard that before. You're like, oh, I haven't heard that, right? Yeah. What's tight to you may not be tight to me, right? We live in this time where there's no such, th such thing as objective truth. It's all subjective. So, so whatever is true is only true to you. It's not really true to me. So what I think is short is really not that short. Or what you think is short is really like long to me. Do you see the danger in that? That's a dangerous place to be when you and I have no type of standard. But here God says this. He says, listen, the body that you have, I have made you in my likeness and in my image. And so if that's the case, then you should be doing everything in your power to preserve your body, to guard your body. Not to just give it to anybody. Not to just give it to this thing or to give it to that thing or just to do whatever it is that you want with it. But you understand the importance of guarding your body because you understand why the body has been given to you. It was this lady by the name of Martha Graham who said, the body is a sacred garment. Martha Graham says, the body is a sacred garment. Garment. It's sacred. It's not something that I just fill up with liquor. It's not something that I just fill up with terrible eating habits. It's not something that I just treat like it's nothing. And I get one hour of sleep a night to the point where my body now begins to break down. And to stay awake, I got to drink like eight Red Bulls an hour. Right? Because it's easy, like, when we talk about the body, when we talk about, you know, preserving your body. Like, the immediate thing that a lot of people go to is the whole sex drink, drinking drink. Man, we talk about practical things such as getting sleep. It's real quiet right there. We must strike a nerve. Like, like, it's not cool for you to get your body only two hours of sleep and all in the name of passing the class. That is not the Lord. You know what that's called? Idolatry. Talk about <laughs> Do you really think God wants you to sacrifice hours upon hours upon hours of sleep just for you to pass the class so much to the point where you get in the test to take the test? You can't even focus and think straight because your mind ain't there? No. This is your body. Your body is a gift. I've given you, your body, as a gift to you to give back to me. Talk about that later. But your body has a purpose. It's sacred. Why, how, why, why is it sacred? Because God made it. Anything that God makes is sacred. It comes from him. He is holy. So it, in and of itself, has to be holy. I hope that makes sense. That's why, right, when you go back to Genesis and when the Bible talks about how Adam saw his wife Eve, he said, this is my wife, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, right? And uh, this whole thing that we have now called holy matrimony. You ever ask the question, why it's called holy matrimony? Why is it holy? Because God sanctioned it. It's not holy unless God sanctions it, which, which, which takes us to a whole other conversation because if God didn't sanction it, then who is the law to sanction certain things? If it's not holy, I hope that makes sense. So two dudes getting married, that's not holy. It's a civil union, but it's not holy matrimony. You ain't in love, you in lust. <laughs> <laughs> Two women getting married. That's not, that's not holy natural. There's nothing holy about that. But what our culture has done is diminished what holiness really is. But God says, listen, when it comes to you understanding who you are in me, and when it comes to you understanding that you are a new creature in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, you are now holy. Holy just simply means set apart. Holy means pure. You see that in this verse of Romans 12 and 1. Your body is to be holy, is to be set apart, it has a purpose. There's a certain thing that God has for it. And that's very tough in our culture because, I said, as I said earlier, our culture thrives off of passion. Our culture thrives off of pleasure. You know what that's called? It's, it's what we know as hedonism, which is the doctrine that pleasure or happiness is the soul or chief good in life. Yeah, a hedonist is a person who is obsessed with pleasing themselves. So whether that is through crazy living, whether that is through doing things like cutting their wrists, whether that is through having to date five or six people at a time just to feel better about themselves. That is a hedonist. God says, listen, the only thing I want you to take pleasure in is your relationship with me. That's the only thing that you need to take pleasure in. Here's the reason why, because that's the only thing that you will find pleasure in. That's the only thing that you will find joy in. That's the only thing that you will find satisfaction in. As long as you continue to solicit your body to everything else but him, 
You will quickly see how empty you are, how much void there is in your life. But the minute you make a decision to submit your body to the Lord and everything that you do, you will see that he is the pleasure that you've been looking for your entire life. So now you no longer are a hedonist, but you are what John Piper calls a Christian hedonist. To now where your pleasure is no longer in self, but your pleasure is in Christ. I hope that makes sense. Tell the person aside to take pleasure in Christ. So by the time you get to Romans chapter 12, verse 1, right, there's a word there. Uh, it's, it, it starts off by saying, therefore. Am I saying therefore? Now, uh, you guys are pretty much smart. Any English majors in here? Anybody an English major? Right, awesome, great. So one of the things that they probably teach you, right, is when you look at, when you begin to read things, you got to look at the certain placement of certain words that are in certain sentences. So when this sentence, and some of your translation starts off by saying, therefore, you have to ask the question, well, what's the therefore, therefore? It's, am I telling the truth, right? Yeah, yeah, you got it. Yeah, huh. yeah, you got to ask the question, right? What's the therefore there for? Why is it there? So, the therefore means that Paul is connecting what he's about to say to something that he just said. And in order for you to appreciate what he's about to say, you got to be able to have a full understanding of what he just said. So, what did he say? Let's go back to verses uh, 33 through 36. In those verses, you begin to see uh, these verses, they're called what theologians call a doxology which is simply a fancy word for an expression of praise. So when you look at verse 33 through 36, it says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has ever been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that said that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. I don't know about you, man. That right there gets me hyped. Especially verse 36. For from him... And through him and to him are all things. You know what that simply means? Everything belongs to him. That's why the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness or everything or everyone that is in it. Which simply means like, uh, last time I checked, we live on earth, right? And if the earth is the Lord's and everything that's in it, then if we're on the earth and the earth is his, then that means we are his. Right? This campus is the government, as crazy as they may be, is because he's in control of it. It may not look like it, but he's shown up is. He's working all things out for the good of those. All things don't mean good things. Sometimes it means good and bad, but it's all working together for one big, great, gigantic, good purpose. And you may not see it right now, hence the reason why the Bible, said, the Bible says that we be made endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning, and that he will give me beauty for ashes. That means that something had to die, something had to be burned, there had to be some type of a destroying thing that took place in order for something to be resurrected. You see that all throughout scripture. As a matter of fact, you see it with Jesus. Because before Sunday can come and before we can shout about the resurrection, before we can shout about the fact that we have a risen Lord and we have been raised to life in Christ, we got to first talk about the fact that he died. The only way you can be raised back to life is you had to die. We don't like to shout about that. Because the dying means that we lose something. God's like, yeah, you might lose something, but you gain something so much more. You gain this new life. You gain this new joy. You gain this new happiness. You gain this thing that you've been longing for, that you've been searching for, that you've been praying for, that you've been losing sleep over year after year, day after day, month after month, week after week. Everything that you've been looking for is ultimately found in him. So when Paul goes all the way back to verses 33 through 36 in Romans 11, and even further when you go back to like chapter 5, he says the reason why I'm saying therefore offer your bodies as a living sacrifice is because of Romans 5 and 8. The Bible says this. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So now, watch this. So he says this in Romans 5 and 8. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Therefore, offer your body as a living sacrifice. Here's what I love about God. God never expects you and I to do something that he has not already done. You know the reason why he can say offer your body as a living sacrifice? Because he did it through Jesus. And so if he offered himself as a living sacrifice... Now, you and I, who are supposed to be in him, are now called to do the same thing for him. I hope that makes sense. So as he offered himself up for us, we now offer up ourselves for him as a living sacrifice. That's ultimately, ultimately what Paul says. He says, 
the hearers of this word, the people who congregate around this word, those who have made a profession of faith and a confession, acknowledging the fact that Jesus was, is Lord, was Lord, will always be Lord, the fact that he died on the cross for the penalty of your sins, the fact that he died on a Friday, he rose on a Sunday morning so that way you and I would be raised to life. Let me help you understand something. There's a lot of dead people walking around on this campus right now. They just don't realize it. You were dead and didn't realize it. But thank God that he opened up your eyes to help you understand that you were dead in your sin, dead in your trespass. Now you are made alive in Christ Jesus. There's a lot of dead people walking around. You know what? You, you know what the goal of focus really is? The goal of focus is to really see dead people raised to life in Christ. It's not hard for you to spot out dead people. Look at their lives. Look, listen to conversations. Look at what they do with their body. There's a whole lot of dead people around this campus. Just walking around. Matter of fact, y'all seen that show, The Walking Dead on AMC? That's right, it's just like that. The Walking Dead. Just, they, they, just breathing to death. Breathing till death. <laughs> and you, with your sanctified holy self, who have been raised to life in Christ, won't even open up your mouth to share with them the thing that can cause them to come out of the grave of sin, out of the tomb of sin, to a new life in Christ. What in the world? How arrogant, how pompous, how uh, conceited, shallow and shy and selfish can I be? To where I won't even share. That's the equivalent of you having the antidote to somebody's sickness, but you hold it on, you hold on to it. Just because you don't want to step outside your comfort zone because you're scared that they may say they don't want it. Really? But are you sure you want to do that? Because what if somebody would have did that for you? What if somebody, you know, they don't look like they want to get better. Mm -hmm. I'm going to just pray that they get better. Right? That's what a lot of times we oftentimes hide behind. I'm going to just pray for them. I'm going to pray that they get better. But God has put you in, a life, in their life to be the antidote for them to be better. But what we do, instead of using our bodies, going back to what Paul says, offering our bodies a living sacrifice, instead of us using our bodies and making ourselves available to people, we just sit back and watch them die and just get slaughtered by the enemy. In order for me to sit back and judge somebody and condemn somebody for the sinful lifestyle and the recklessness that may be going on in their life and the ratchetness that they may be engaging in, you know what that means? That means you have not come fully into a full understanding of what God has done for you and how much he's forgiven you of. Because if you did and I did, we would be compelled to go share that with somebody else. That's why Paul is so adamant. He says, therefore, I urge you. Urge is a strong word. It simply means I beg you. I strongly encourage you. I'm pushing you off your body's a living sacrifice. Why? Because after everything that God has done in Ruben chapters 1 through 11, what else does he need to show me? What else does he just gave me hundreds of verses up to this point. And all he's asking is for one verse. Offer your body as a living sacrifice. That's all I'm asking. He just laid out how he forgives us, forgiving people who are homosexuals. He just laid out in scripture how he's forgiving people of sexual immorality. He's just forgiving people who are liars. He's forgiving people who are backbiters. He's forgiving all these type of people. He's gone all through Romans 1, all the way up to now Romans 12. And so he says, listen, in, in view of all of that, that's what he says there, in view of God's mercy. God's mercy simply means God did not give us what you and I deserve. In perspective of that, in light of his mercy, this is what you and I should do for God. Give ourselves to him. So you're looking for, well, so what, what am I supposed to do with my body? Number one, the first thing I'm going to do with my body is I'm to give it to God. Tell the person beside you, give your body to God. Yeah. Guarding my body, the best way to guard my body is to recognize that I can't guard it on my own. The best way to preserve my body is by me understanding that I can't preserve it on my own. The best way to keep my body pure is by me recognizing that on my own, I cannot do this. How many of you guys have ever in here said that you were not going to do something with your body, but you actually did it anyway? I'm not trying to get you to go down some nasty path of memories. I'm talking about simple stuff like, yo, you said I'm not going to eat sweet stuff, and you did it anyway. Right? Right? You said, you know what? I'm not going to eat any more Chick-fil-A. I've been going hard all week long. I've been swiping the mess out of my car so much to the point where that drink don't even work no more. I'm going to have some self-control and some discipline. But you did it anyway. Right. 
Paul says, listen, you cannot control your body on your own. The only way it can be under control is by submitting it to the Lord. Give your body to God. That's what Paul is saying here. He says, offer your bodies. I love what he says here. Offer it. Offer it, which simply means it's a choice. God's not making me do this. He says, offer it. And the reason why he can use it, it's amazing how he goes from saying something so strong like I urge you to something so soft like offer. It's amazing. Because he says, in view of God's mercy, that's where all the weight is. And so now the offering is just simply the byproduct of what he's done for me. So it's like, you know what? So you say that you have received the mercy of God. You've experienced the love of Christ. Offer your body. Prove it to him. Show everybody that you really are a recipient of his grace. Live it out. Walk it out. Don't just walk it out amongst your Christian friends. It's easy to do that. It's easy to be like, yo, I read, I read this in such and such scripture. And you know what I'm saying? The Lord is just speaking this to me. And, and, God, and God is just leading me to fast and pray and do all this type of stuff. And just walk around the line seven times just praying that all of a sudden grades are going to go from the grade from an F to an A. Like you can say all that spiritual hocus pocus stuff all you want to. But if you're not putting it into action, then it doesn't matter. That's what you saw in the skit. She heard the word. Right? Ephesians 4 29. She was excited about it. She stood to her feet. She said, I want the spirits. <laughs> like super duper excited, super duper amped up. But then when the rubber really hit the road, she got pulled in by the conversation. So instead of using her body for righteousness in that moment, she used it for wickedness to tear down. It's, it, it is so easy. It is so easy to wreck Christ in here. It's so easy to sing hill song songs in here. Right? That's awesome. Nothing wrong with that. Do that. That's the purpose of corporate worship and corporate fellowship. Can you do that in your room amongst people who are trifling, amongst people who are crazy, amongst people who ate all your food and lied to your face that they did not? Can you still do that then? That's me offering my body as a living sacrifice. That's, that's, that's ultimately what it's about. It's a sacrifice. You know what that means? It simply means it's requiring something greater of me then I actually want to give. It's not a sacrifice if it's easy for me to give. Like, like if I give you a dollar and I get a million, that's not a sacrifice. Yo, man, I just want to bless you, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> boy just laid this on my heart just to give you a dollar. The person might be like, man, yo, this ain't, man, oh, man, this is awesome. Man, I appreciate you sacrificing. You ain't sacrificing nothing. That's a drop in the bucket. That's nothing, man. And though that person may not see your heart, God does. He's like, man, I ain't blessing that. Because that's not a sacrifice for you. The sacrifice is when you do the reverse. You need a dollar? I give you 999,000. Some of y'all are like, mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a sacrifice. Because now you have depleted everything of you. Let me help you understand something. In the Old Testament, when Paul talks about this, you've got to understand the Old Testament reference. The Old Testament reference was in the Old Testament days, in order for uh, payment for sin to be, to, for, in order for payment to sin to take place, something had to die. There had to be a sacrifice that was offered, offered up. Here's the reason why by the time you get to the New Testament, Jesus was called the perfect lamb of God. He was sacrificed. He laid his life down. He spilled out his own blood. In the Old Testament, what God would do, he says, in order for sin to be atoned for, something has to die. And he could have easily made a person die, but he was like, listen, you know what? Moses, instead of punishing you, I'm going to punish the animal. And so what I want you to do is I want you to get it going. When you look at scriptures uh, like Leviticus chapter uh, Leviticus chapter 7, you look at all these different type of regula regulations that God gives. He says, listen, I want you to take a goat, um, offer it up. It has to be without blemish. It has to be without spot. It has to be essentially perfect. I want you to slit his throat, and I will uh, essentially forgive sins because there is an atonement through the blood. That's what essentially he says. Now, what's amazing about that was God wasn't just like, yo, just slit, slit like a, a small slither of the goat. Just like prick his, prick his hand and, and let some blood come out. Like one drop is good enough. God was like, no, cut the whole thing. Like let everything just pour out of his neck. Like some crazy horror movies I joined. That's a sacrifice because it requires everything. And for some of us, we're trying to figure out, yo, why is God not blessing me? And I've been praying for this, and I've been asking God for, to, to do this. I've been asking God for breakthrough in my life. I've been asking God to, to, uh, to, to give me favor in my class. And God's like, you're not sacrificing nothing. 
So you just think that I'm just going to bless you and you're not offering nothing up to me. I'm not going to do that. That goes contrary to who I am and who I am and who I've always been and who I will always be. And for me to do that now is essentially for me to almost kind of slander my own name. Because now this says that, you know what, I am a God who does change. He says, no, I'm the God who never changes. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever more. You want God to do something amazing in your life? Sacrifice. Offer something up. Offer something up. You want to be a blessing to somebody? Give until it hurts. I know that's not popular teaching and preaching. I know that probably goes contrary to everything that you probably know. I know that's probably not cool and it's probably not comfortable. If it's not comfortable, that's because God is calling you to do it. Do you think it was comfortable for Jesus to get on the cross? Oh man, this nail just feels real good. Man, awesome. Man, this nail feels even better. No. It hurts. It costs something. And what most of us want to do is we want to give something without it costing us. That is not a sacrifice. Not at all. That is a convenient gift. That is not a sacrifice. I give as long as I can. You know what? It's, it's, it's like uh, some of you guys in here who drive and all that type of stuff. You may have people who ask for rides and all that type of stuff. You know what? It's the equivalent of um, giving somebody a ride and be like, oh, hold on, before you get out of the car, where's my gas money? But, but before that, you were like, yo, I got you. I'll get you a ride home. I got you, dog. I got you. Girl, you know I got you. I ain't gonna let you walk all the way to the village by yourself from Powell to Ann. Be a blessing. I wanna serve. And so they get out of the car, they're like, oh man, I just want to thank you, man. You're, you're, the, you're really my sister in Christ. Like everybody else, man, they just trying to get something out of me. Da, da, da. And you're like, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's awesome. Uh, see, my gas tank right now. <laughs> <laughs> see, like, that drink be fluctuating. And like, if you could just give me five, that'd give me like a gallon at least. Sacrifice when somebody come and ask you for a ride and your light is on. Because now you got to choose whether or not they get home before you do. Mmm. Mmm. You don't have to say mmm. I'll say mmm for you. Mmm. <laughs> because it's a clear cut path. It's either you or them. <laughs> right? And so you try to be all super deep, like, yeah, man, like, I'm supposed to be meeting somebody, I'm supposed to be studying, you know what I'm saying? Like, no, 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 no. Ain't nothing going on. All your tail going to do is go to the crib and watch some old rerun episodes of the game. That's all you're about to do. Get him right. That's a sacrifice. Everybody say sacrifice. sacrifice. So Paul says this. He says, offer your body as a sacrifice. That's ultimately what it's about. In response to what God has done for me by offering up Jesus for my sins, I have been made alive in Christ, which means I am now to offer my life to God and him alone through my body. First Corinthians 6, 19 says this. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you? Who you have received from God? You are not your own. Let me help you understand something. You are not your own. Let me help you understand something. You are not your own. Tell the person beside you. You are not your own. Your body is not yours. You are not the owner of your body. You are a steward of your body. A steward is just a manager. I don't know if you guys have ever been to like a restaurant, like all of a sudden, like and like the manager manager really tried to like buck and really like act like they got some serious power because they're, like they're above people and they act like they don't have nobody above them. I don't know if y'all have ever been in an atmosphere like that, but I've seen that happen on a few occasions where like you'll talk to the manager and they're like, um, "Sorry, sir, um, you no, I mean we just, we just don't do that. No, mm -mm, not at all." As if to say that you own this whole restaurant. Are you serious? Do you not know that I can go above you? Matter of fact, let me, let me bring it home, right? Some of y'all got teachers who are like that. They just like disrespectful, they try to buck on you, they try to go crazy on you. Mind you, your professors, they got a dean too. They got a boss. Some of y'all that got real irate and be like, oh no. <laughs> no, I paid 1500 for this class. <laughs> Study my tail off and you gonna cheat me like this? Oh no. Who's, I'm going to the dean, right? And all of a sudden, now your professor is like, hey man, you know, um, <laughs> how you doing, you know, how you doing? Because they got threatened that that check was going to be good to have, the mic was going to be cut off. Bumper government shut down, that's a check shut down. <laughs> because ultimately what Paul is helping us understand is the same thing that you and I see on a regular basis. 
that what we have does not belong to us. We are stewards. Remember, as I said earlier, the scripture in the song, everything that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. You are not your own. Your body does not belong to you, which means if it does not belong to you, if it does not belong to me, then if it belongs to God, then that means I have to use it in a way that honors God. So Paul says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Right? In other words, what is he saying? You are the church. The temple. Why would you desecrate your temple and claim to follow Christ? I have no problem with people who decide, man, you know, I'm going to get this piercing and, you know, I've been praying about getting a tattoo. I've been praying about getting, I've been praying about getting a tattoo. Right? Um, I, like, cool, whatever. But, but when you got Birdman tattoos all over your face and neck and arms and ankles and, and, and hamstrings and calves and knees. I mean, everything is tatted up. Like, yo, your body's the temple. Like, like, who are you trying to be like? Are you trying to be like culture? Are you trying to be like Christ? No, man, I'm just trying to be a bridge. I'm just trying to showcast, man, that yo, you can be cool and saved at the same time, yo. No, you're just trying to compromise. That's all it is. Is there anything wrong with getting an earring? No. Nothing wrong. Is there anything wrong with getting a tattoo? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why I say I don't know is because there's plenty of scriptures that can go like to support not getting a tattoo, but there's not really scripture that says not to get a tattoo. So I can't speak definite. Here's what I will say. Is the spirit leading you to do that? That usually shuts the question down right there. Did the Lord really lead you to do that? Like, have somebody ink up your back? Pour all this money just for something to get removed 10 years from now. That's not good stewardship. That's bad stewardship. You spend $600 getting tapped. And they would be like, well, I don't even like this, Jay. Oh. <laughs> oh, man, the spirit was really leading you to do that. <laughs> Paul says, your body is not your own. So if your body is not your own, you need to consult who it belongs to. That's why you got to pray about who you actually get in relationship with. Because when you get in a relationship with somebody, the purpose of you being in a relationship with somebody is not just so that way you can just have a little butt buddy. <laughs> let, me, let, let, let me contextualize it. So you know, the purpose of you having a relationship is not so that way you can have somebody who's a friend with benefits. Say it like that. That's, that's, not, that's not the purpose. The purpose of you being in a relationship, even if you're saved, even if you're following the Lord, is not so that way you can feel whole. If you need a person to make you feel whole, then you would never hold to begin with. <laughs> That's why Jesus comes and he says, listen, man, I come to make you whole again. He said that to plenty of people. Lady with the issue of blood, make you whole again. Samaritan woman at the well had numerous relationships. Some, pretty much an adulterous lifestyle. Jesus is like, listen, you don't need that no more. You need me. What happened? She left her life of sin and went and told everybody about it. Your body is not your own, so if that's the case, that means I gotta consult the one who I belong to. I promise you, if we would probably pray about relationships, probably wouldn't have a whole lot of broken hearts. Probably wouldn't have a whole lot of divorces. Probably wouldn't have a whole lot of STDs. Probably wouldn't be a whole lot of breakout on AIDS, man. I don't know, I don't want to scare you guys, but but, but this area, North, North, is considered to be one of the highest concentrated areas for STDs and AIDS. Hmm. I'm not gonna press that anymore. I'm just gonna let that marinate. So the next time, right? You, you have this R. Kelly moment where your mind is telling you no, <laughs> but, but your body. I, I want you to go back. I, I want you to go back. Yo, hold on. Pastor Elmo said that STDs are high as so no. And I don't know if this person has one. But even if they don't, I'm not taking a chance. Because one, this is not the Lord's way. And two, I'm just not trying to get no STD. <laughs> Some of y'all know people who got STDs. Some of y'all know people who got AIDS. Right? You know people. You've seen just how the enemy just runs rampant. And, and 
And unfortunately, maybe some of us are even in that path. Here's the good news, even if you are, because I never want to say something that's like really shocking, but not give you the good news and not give you the, the grace in this. The awesome thing is even if you happen to be in this particular state, even if you have this particular issue in your life, you may have an STD, you, you, you may have some type of a disease, whatever the case may be, because of sexual immorality, whatever the case may be, the awesome thing is this. There is nothing that is more powerful than the blood of Christ. And when he says that I will make you into a new creature, into a new person, that is the truth. Yeah. That is the truth. When he says that he is a healer, that means he can heal. When he says that he can deliver, that means he will deliver. Will he always deliver? I can't say that he will. Will he always heal? I can't say that he will. Why can't you say that? Because his thoughts are higher than mine. His ways are higher than mine. So even what I think is good is not good enough compared to him. So if he doesn't heal, that simply means because there was something better than he had. But I don't understand, how can this not be the best option? I have no idea what God does. In due time, as you follow him, he will show you. But you never have to worry about that if you would remember to guard your body, that, that your body is ultimately to be given to God. First Corinthians 6.13, in that same chapter, he says this, Paul says this, he says, food for the stomach and stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. My body was made for the Lord. My body was made for the Lord. I promise you, if we would go out of this room sharing this message with people, you would see less people getting pregnant, having babies, having to drop out of school. You would see less people at the health clinic having to get shots. You would see less people having to leave school or having to get a job to go support themselves because they have a condition now that they have to take care of. You would see less of that. You have the antidote. Tell people, yo, your body is not your own, man. Tell them. Share it with them. In grace, in love. Don't just go buck on them. Hey, yo, get out the bed. <laughs> what you doing? Your body. Your body doesn't belong to him. First of all, um, why, why, why would you even... <laughs> Wow, like, <laughs> confused by that. Sorry, that was an Evan moment right there. Like, I think, like, what, are you, what are you doing? Why are you, why are you there? Um, your body is not yours. That's what Paul says. Offer your body as a living sacrifice. Your body belongs to the Lord. He created you for him. See, we, in this hedonistic culture, we believe that everything is for our pleasure and our enjoyment. God did not put us here for our enjoyment. He did not make you for your enjoyment. He made you for his pleasure. And he made you more important so that way you can enjoy him. Here's the byproduct when you enjoy him. When you enjoy him, you will enjoy whoever God sends your way in holy matrimony. That's the benefit and the byproduct. But you can't get the byproduct without first going through the process. See, a lot of us just, I mean, you know people that just want to play house. <laughs> Some of y'all get that late. Like, like you, just, you know people who, like, like, I just want you to play my boyfriend. Like, be, be my girl. Check yes, check no, maybe, whatever. Like, listen, let's just do whatever we want. And if you're not careful, you'll get so caught up in that. Your body does not belong to you. You are a steward over it, which means God has called you to manage it. He's called you to be a good steward over it. So that means I gotta get rest. That means I gotta be just, I gotta, I gotta eat healthy. I'm not saying that you gotta go on some crazy vegan diet where you just eat only things that come from the ground and not animal products. I'm not saying go that far. Y'all ever think about this is side of your question? <laughs> I mean, you know, this is this is something that we think about, right? You know, people have this vegan diet. I'm, I'm not even knocking it. Like, hey, man, this is what the Lord is leading you to do. Awesome. Amen. God led Jesus not to eat for 40 days, so I'm not even going to say what he's leading you to do. But here's what I want to argue. I want to argue your rationale. So people be like, yo, um, I'm on a vegan diet because we don't want to eat any type of animal products because we don't want to kill any animals. Cool. I I'm with that. I'm down. Here's my question with my educated self. <laughs> if you eat all the stuff that the animal eats, what the animal gonna eat? <laughs> right? Eventually, if you eat all the stuff that the animal eat, the animal's gonna start dying. Right? Don't tell me I don't want the only one who ever thought that. Right? It's just some food talk, you know what I'm saying? It's just some food talk, right? It's just some food talk. 
So, that, that was my little soapbox moment. I'm back. Okay, cool. So, here's what I'm saying, though. Your body is the Lord, so that means you need to be a good steward over that. So, what you put in your body, what you consume, the rest that you get, the environment that you're around, uh, habits like smoking and drinking. Um, some, of, some of us may ask the question, well, you know, the Bible doesn't say not to drink. The Bible doesn't say to drink. So, I can't use that. But anything now that can corrode my body, I don't want to engage in that. I'm not saying don't eat ice cream. I'm not saying don't go, don't, don't go get like a little Shirley Temple, a little mix between Sprite and some strawberry grenadine or whatever the case may be. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying go to Tropical Smoothie and not get a Paradise uh, or Paradise Point or Pomegranate Plunge with kiwi with no banana. That's what I like to get. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm saying, yes, it's cool. Enjoy those things. But be mindful. Be mindful of your body. Be mindful of what you consume. Right? God was so serious about this and so serious, which is the second point, about understanding that my body is to be pure. That's why he says holy. Holy in the Greek simply means pure or set apart. That's what he says here in Romans 12 and 1. God was so serious about the purity of his people in the Old Testament, the Israelite people, that he gave dietary regulations for what they were to eat. So he would say things like this in, in, in Leviticus chapter 7. He would say stuff like, do not eat this particular animal, do not eat the fat of the animal, do not eat the blood of the animal, don't eat things like a bat. Like, hold on, man. You gotta tell me not to eat a bat, something's wrong. I mean, like seriously, he, he would literally have a strict guideline for what they were to eat. Here was the reason why God was so strict about it, because he wanted to show them that there is a clear distinction between you who have been redeemed by me, who follow me in faith, compared to everybody else in the world. And so when he gave this diet, it was primarily for the Israelites after they got delivered out of Egypt. He says, listen, in Egypt, you ate everything. In slavery, you ate whatever master gave you. Now that you are free, we're no longer going to eat like we're slaves. The problem maybe with some of us is we say we're free, but we still live as slaves. Like, like you still want the slave lifestyle with, with, with the freedom of somebody who's been free. God says, no. He was so serious about the purity of his people. He gave strict dietary laws. Now, does that apply for today? No, not at all. Because later on in scripture, you see Paul even writes here in the same book of Romans, he says that everything should be received with things given unto God. So whether it's meat, whether it's chicken, chocolate smoothie, Chick-fil-A, pizza, give God thanks for it because it came from God. Because now it's not, my sanctity is not based upon external things. My sanctity is based upon what God has done for me internally and in, in, in the spiritual. But my body is to be pure, which means I don't need to be doing things that defile my body. First Corinthians 6, that same chapter in verse 12, he says everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial, which means I can't do everything I see done. I can't engage in every activity I see done. I can't just do everything just because it feels good. No, not at all, because now that means that my body is my master as opposed to the Lord being the master. Now I'm following what my flesh wants and what I desire as opposed to what the spirit wants. And we've seen this happen plenty of times in our own lives. And I will promise you that it probably did not end on a good note. You probably felt terrible about it. How many of you guys have ever overeaten in here before? Everybody's hands should go up. Don't be like, you ain't never overeaten. You've overeaten before, right? Like your eyes got bigger than your stomach extension. Like you, you just ate and ate and ate. Like it's like you got a tapeworm. You know what I'm saying? Like you just, you just eat whatever you see. And you probably felt bad after it. I'm not just talking about like, oh man, I shouldn't have ate all that. No, you feel it here. <laughs> like, like, you ate too much of that. <laughs> you ate too much of this cat food. And this just ran right through your tail. <laughs> so much to the point. I'm going to stop because my mind is going elsewhere. Like, I just had a picture of Lysol and... <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And toilet paper that just ran out, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, y'all can act like y'all ain't never, you can act like you ain't never been there, but you've been there before. When you overeat and you pay the consequences for it, right? You ain't paid the consequences for it. You may have stomach flu, you may have been thrown up all night, all day, whatever the case may be. Because ultimately what happens is when you begin to overindulge in things that may be good for you, but in too much is bad for you, Paul essentially says everything may be permissible, which means you can do anything that you want. But the question that I ask is, how does it benefit me? How does this build me up? How does this grow me now in my relationship with the Lord? Here's the question that you can ask. Why, why do I have to do this? Because Ephesians 4.22 says this, put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. 
by its deceitful desires. Take off your old garment of clothing, your old way of living, your old way of thinking, your old way of offering your body up to this world, letting the world just run rampant through your life. So whatever drink the world offers you, you take it. Whatever party the world offers you, you're there, you're there twerking. Uh, whatever person that the world has to offer, you get with them. God's like, listen, be free from that. Take that off. Put on your new self in Christ. And you no longer have to be a slave to what you feel. But now bring your body into subjection to the will of God. That's guarding your body. Guarding my body, lastly, is all about me understanding that my body is to be used for God's purpose and his pleasure. That's what it's all, always about. That's why he says later on here in the scripture, pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And I want to close with this. The purpose of your body is simply to worship God and to honor God. Spiritual act of worship. That means now in everything that I do, I look at everything that I do as worship unto the Lord. So that has to do with my studies. That has to do with my relationships. That has to do with my eating habits. Like you, you would think that something as small as being disciplined to a diet during the week, you would think that that's probably not a big deal. That's a big deal. I've seen that in my own life. Because now what happens is if you will compromise on something as small as that, then now what the enemy does is he takes that foothold, as the Bible talks about in Ephesians 4, he takes this foothold and begins to give you now bigger doses and bigger doses. So now if I can get you to compromise on something small, then the reality is, and the chances are, you'll compromise on something that's bigger than that. And so now what happens is you end up compromising on something small and it leads to something bigger and your life is all to pieces and you ask the question, how did I get here and how did you get here? Because it started with a small compromise. That's how it started. Because I didn't bring my body and its desires into subjection to the will of God. Our bodies are to be pleasing unto God only. This is our worship to God. First Thessalonians 4 3 says this It is God's will that you be sanctified, that you be, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God. And that first verse of First Thessalonians 4 1, he says this, he says, Our goal is to please God. That's it. I don't live to please my boo. I don't live to get the attention of other people. You see plenty of people like that. They dress a certain way to get the attention of certain people. Here's what's sad about it. The certain people they try to impress ain't even think about it. That's the heartbreaking part. Like Casper got all dressed up for Web Center, you know what I'm saying? Like, like they done put perfume on and cologne on and got a fresh fitted cap and, and, and got some fresh hair because they went down to the, to the store and, and, and just slapped it on. And you know what I'm saying? And because they knew that such and such from the Q's or the Alphas were going to be there party hopping, doing their thing. And they said, yo, if I just get a seat up in Web Center on one of those high chairs and if I just cross my legs like this or something like that, then somebody who's party hopping may see me do a double take and then I may get the attention. But then you find out quickly. And, and at the expense of your heart that they want me to think about you. So you put in all this work, got all glistened up, lips all wet with just every ounce of lip gloss. Do you to have somebody come to your apartment, line you up? You know what I'm saying? You like got all fresh up. You got a, you went to you went to Dillard's and MacArthur, and you know what I'm saying, or Nordstrom and MacArthur. You went to the to the eyes eye section. You got a fresh eyes eye button down shirt. You know what I'm saying? And 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 you were just ready. Your jacket had creases in it and everything. <laughs> Only to find out that they didn't even, they didn't show up at it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Just wasted a good hour. How many of you guys have ever had one for them? Right? Dang, man, I should have worn this tonight. Right. Okay, come back, come back, come back, come back. Right. So, the whole goal Paul says here is to please God. That's it. So now when I get dressed, I should not have a person in mind. I should not have a dude in mind. Right? Now, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say it right there because this is real. Because I believe a lot of us need to be delivered from that because when you get dressed, when you look in the mirror, you think of what somebody may think of you. This determines how much, how many layers of makeup you put on, you just keep piling it on, right? <laughs> <laughs> this determines how small you wanna get. So you do 100 push-ups before you go to Wednesday before you put a shirt on because you wanna look super duper diesel. <laughs> right, right. This determines like 
what shoes you're gonna wear today, and 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 how 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 you press your pants and all this type of stuff. You have a person in mind, and God is saying the only person you, be, you should be thinking about pleasing is me. So the question you should be asking is, what is this too low, God? Yes. yes. I'm changing. It. I want to, but I will. <laughs> God, is 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 this is 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 what I'm wearing as a guy? Is this is this something that can cause somebody to fall in lust? Is, is this pleasing to you? That's the question you and I have to ask every day. God, is this pleasing to you? Are my study habits, are they pleasing to you? Is, is, does my diet, is it pleasing to you? Do, do I just eat whatever I see? You know, just, just go to the pot and just eat whatever. And then you and the nurses all just get your blood pressure on that. You know what I'm saying? Now you come to TNT praying, you know, you put prayer requests in. I just need God to bring my blood pressure down on me. You know, I'm starting to see things, red dots and all this type of stuff. And, 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 and the devil's attacking me. No, your diet is attacking me. That's the problem. You ain't got no control over your body. So you just eat whatever you want. God says, listen, listen, in everything that you do, the question has to go to, am I, is, is God pleased with how I'm using my body? Is he pleased? Is, is he pleased? With my workout regimens, do, do, do I just have a sloth spirit? <laughs> when you get a lot of workout in your head, thinking about the gym, the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. You'll never make it to the gym. The walk, the thought of the walk kills you. I ain't going to that. <laughs> y'all know I'm telling the truth. Some of y'all like, I'm like, too far. And you got a car, but that's too far. Nah, no, that show don't be taking too long. No, man, no. Yeah. Show, I don't even know what they doing, though. But they, they be all over it. Mick off. <laughs> I, I had to ask this question. God, am I pleasing you with, with my body? Am, am, I using, am I using my body to serve you? Am I using my body to serve you? Am I using my body to serve in ministry? Am I using my body to do things like divine minds? Am I using my body to serve on the worship team? Am I using my body to greet people at the door? Am I using my body on campus to, to be able to share the message of Christ, to share the love of Christ? Am I using my body to your standards? Because it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to you. It's the question you and I have to ask. In closing, Matthew 22, 37, Jesus says this. He answers the guy who asked him, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus says this is simple. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, with your body. Love God with everything. Don't, nothing, nothing should be off limits when it comes to my walk with the Lord as it pertains to my body. So sometimes, you know what? That may mean that I have to get up early to spend time with the Lord. God help you. <laughs> sometimes, yeah, that may mean I may have to Sacrifice watching TV to, to, to put a little bit of extra study time, whether it's of my word or, or for my class. That yeah, I, I need to get in the gym, man. Like, I weigh too much. That's, I mean, that's real talk. Like, for real. Like, I'm, I'm kind of like obese. I'm, I'm obese at this age, you know? And it don't help that you got some stuff running in your family that are taking people out. But you think you're invincible because you're in college. Cats fall out every day. God says, listen, honor me with, with your body. Honor me with your body. This is your spiritual act of worship. Worship is not about you just coming here lifting up holy hands and you singing your song. And you sing a tithe for a bit and, and any other song that Groundbreakers leads us in. That's a, that's a dynamic and, and, a, and a part of worship. A true worship is you offering yourself up to God. And so this is why now when we come in here on a, on a Tuesday night and gather for corporate worship, who you are in here is simply a byproduct of who you are not in here. So if in private you offer your body to the Lord in worship, when it's time to come in here, it's easy to lift up hands. It's easy to clap hands because this ain't the first time you've done it. But if it's the first time you've done it, then it's, it's, it's going to be a little awkward. It's like, it's like running a race. If you ain't never practiced and you get on the track for the first time, you ain't making it around the first 100 meters. You win it. <laughs> Your body won't in shape because you didn't discipline. Such is the same now when it comes to 
our relationship with the Lord. God calls us to honor him with our bodies, to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. So the question I want to leave you with is this tonight. Are you offering your body, are you guarding your body the way God has called you to guard it? Are you being disciplined and diligent? Am I being disciplined and diligent? Are we being disciplined and diligent of being a good steward over the body that God has given us? I don't know about you, but but, but I want to I have like a testimony like Moses, but the Bible says that he was 120 years old, but did not lose any sight in his eyes or strength in his body. He was 120 years old, but probably had the body of a 40 year old because he honored God with his body. He worshiped God, he served God. That can be you, that can be me. But in order for that to happen, gotta guard our bodies, gotta be intentional.